Multi Hazards, all about protecting communities. Hi everyone, this is Multi Hazards, a podcast where we take a deep dive into issues in emergency management, climate change adaptation, security, etc. I'm your host, Vin Nelson, and I'm really excited. Today is our first show. I'll give you a bit of a preview of some of the topics we'll cover and share the reasons why I started this podcast. Now, to kick off our show and series, the first thing we need to do is say what Canadians call a territorial acknowledgement. So this is about the First Nations land on which I am presently broadcasting just outside Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. So I've borrowed the text of this territorial acknowledgement from our local college, Kwantlen Polytechnic University. So here we go. We work, study, and live in a region south of the Fraser River, which overlaps with the unceded traditional and ancestral lands of the Kwantlen, Musqueam, Katsi, Semiamu, Sawasan, Kikite, and Kwikwetlam peoples. I'd like to tell you some of the podcasters who inspired me to produce this multi-hazard podcast, and I would like to publicly thank them even before we begin this whole adventure. First of all, there's Doug Parsons, who makes America Adapts, which is a rare climate change adaptation podcast. He's been going at it for a few years, and he's inspired me to get into this niche. I do believe that we need a lot more public education about climate change adaptation blasting out. Secondly, Suzanne Berni from Disaster Heroes. Suzanne Berni, she was actually my professor last year at the Justice Institute of British Columbia. And I took a course from her in crisis communications. She was one of my nicest and most helpful instructors. And as I've been going jogging almost every day, I've been listening to podcasts and hers is one of my favorite. Both of these people, Doug and Suzanne, they actually spoke to me over the phone, gave me some advice, and I want to thank them right now because I feel so privileged to have their assistance. Thirdly, I'd like to thank Dr. Michel C. Doré. I met him at uh, the end of October in 2018 in Vancouver at a, uh, a an emergency management conference. It was sponsored by the Canadian Hazards and Risk Network, the CHR Net, and there was a career night. I met him, and he encouraged me to go into emergency management and use my past experience as an educator. He also emailed me when after the conference and I had asked him how we can get emergency management and climate change adaptation fields working together. So he actually sent me some links on multi-hazards and I reread them recently and got inspired to use that as the name of this podcast series. So I want to thank Michelle again. Now, why did I call it multi-hazards? The United Nations International Strategy for Disaster Reduction defines hazard as a dangerous phenomenon, substance, human activity, or condition that may cause loss of life, injury, or other health impacts, property damage, loss of livelihoods and services, social and economic disruption, or environmental damage. So they also mentioned that hazards of natural origin and related environmental and technological hazards and risks. That's a definition of hazards they get. And they also go on to say these are geological, meteorological, hydrological, oceanic, biological, and technolo <laughs> sorry, technological. I know I, yeah, I screw up on one of those long words. All right, and now sometimes they, they said they're, sometimes they're acting in, in combination. Aha! In combination! That sounds like multi. So we have the word multi-hazards. 
I'm taking this definition from a 2016 scholarly article by two professors from the Department of Geography in King's College, London, UK. One is Joel C. Gill. The second one is Bruce D. Malamud. So in this 2016 article called Hazard Interactions and Interaction Networks Cascades Within Multi-Hazard Methodologies, it, this article, their goal was to go beyond the simple overlay of multiple single hazards. That is the one-by-one -one approach. For example, we have windstorms and we have flooding. So instead, they provided an enhanced framework that encompasses the interactions between these different hazards. So they came up with three groups of hazards. One, they call it natural hazards coming from the natural environment. Second, anthropogenic processes coming from humans. And thirdly, technological hazards slash disasters. And they also outlined three types of interactions that these various hazards can have. One is triggering. The second is increased probability. And the third, now this is uh, a little bit difficult, but it's called catalysis, which means, I looked it up online, it's the acceleration of a chemical reaction by a catalyst, slash impedance, which means resistance. And thirdly, they assess the importance of these networks of interactions, these cascades. So, for example, two years before that article, so in another article, 2014, Gill and Malamud, they took 21 different natural hazards and they identified 90 possible interactions between the 441, 21 times 21 combinations. Now, fast forward to March 2020. In a journal called Earth's Future, Joel C. Gill and many other authors, they had an article called Why we can no longer ignore consecutive disasters. And here's what it says. Current state-of-the-art risk assessment models and their outputs don't allow for a thorough representation and analysis of consecutive disasters. Why not? This is mainly due to the many challenges that are introduced by addressing and combining hazards of different nature and accounting for their interactions and dynamics. Disaster risk management needs to be more holistic and co-designed between researchers, policymakers, first responders, and companies. So, basically, there isn't some magical computer program that can deal with multi-hazards. Yes, it's a science, but it's also a collaborative effort from people from many different kinds of expertise. So there's not going to be some, some magic bullet. It's going to take time. It's going to take people from different fields. Yes, computer modeling may be a big part of it, but there has to be a lot of discussion, a lot of research and a lot of eyes on what nature is doing so that we can figure out hazards and how they interact with each other. Now, this podcast uses two definitions of multi-hazards. One, multi as in multiple or many. Two, multi as in how these disasters affect each other, like a domino or cascading effect. And I've chosen as the photo to symbolize this podcast, dominoes that are falling in a circle. All right. So two of the main themes we have are what we call CCA, climate change adaptation, and EM, emergency management. Climate change. Now, climate change, what is it? I would like to actually take one step beyond climate change and say one of the big problems humanity has is the destruction of of the environment. We have been wholesale raping, pillaging, slaughtering the environment through our development. As the population has been growing, we need places to live, we need food to eat, and we need fuel to burn, 
And guess what? We have basically mowed down forests. We have changed the landscape. We have thrust pollution into the air. Yes, one of the main features and the worst ones is climate change. Now, climate change, it is real. Human activity in the last century or so has caused it. But along with this, we have loss of biodiversity. We have the rapid extinctions of many animal species. We have deforestations. So this is, this is the perfect storm of where risks, old and new, are increasing. And our communities, our economies, our families, our own personal safety, our health, these are all at risk. So over the years, climate change has, we can say, produced two main fields. Now, in the early stages, we could say 80s, 90s, mitigation was the big deal. That means decreasing greenhouse gases, carbon, methane, etc., going into the atmosphere. And this has been a big issue, especially 2019. We had many young people on the streets. We had workers. Even I went to a big protest in Vancouver demanding the governments to work on decreasing, like seriously decreasing greenhouse gases. Now, of course, the coronavirus epidemic, which we're currently in, that kind of put a, a stop to people going on the streets as much except for people protesting lockdowns but it's still a big deal mitigation and we still haven't really done much to solve it now secondly we have adaptation so what does that mean this means adapting to the effects of climate change some good mostly bad because honestly we're already locked in we're locked in to the earth warming up a few degrees and that is because the past few decades of greenhouse gas emissions what does that mean it means we are locked in to warming to more destructive extreme weather events like more intense a greater magnitude and what is that equal it means we have to prepare now listen what is weather weather is what's happening outside our windows today i'm looking out it's getting sunny it had rained a lot so that's today's temperature humidity precipitation or not so that's weather but what is climate exactly climate is a record of weather over 30 years what happens when the climate is changing in ways that we can hardly keep up with what if our weather patterns are getting stranger and stranger? We need to be able to predict or have a good understanding as much as we can of what's coming down the pike. So computer modeling of future scenarios, this helps. We need to have as many people involved looking down the road and seeing how can we prepare for the worst while hoping for the best. Now, here's one question. Is climate change adaptation really a professional field? Can you go online and look for climate change adaptation jobs? What's the answer? The answer is yes. It is a new and emerging field. For example, in recent years, there has been a study by the Kresge Foundation in the U.S. It was called Rising to the Challenge Together. So they found a budding professional field in need of rapid expansion, accelerated and deeper practice, a clearer common purpose, and much stronger policy and financial support to realize its promise. So they defined a professional field as this. The necessary expertise and skilled workforce clarity on good or best practice established as common practice advancing shared goals and values professionals networks and leaderships 
adequate training, political and public support, problems being solved effectively, efficiently, and in an integrated manner, and as a result, reduced societal burdens and maximized opportunities. So if the adaptation field were more fully developed, it would have the nationwide capacity, I would say worldwide capacity to effectively and equitably close the resilience gap for all. Now here's some examples. Um, in the US, there is the American Society of Adaptation Professionals. In Canada, there is the Canadian, sorry, the Climate Change Adaptation Community of Practice, the CCACOP. It's Canada's only online community for adaptation experts, policymakers, and practitioners. In Vancouver, Canada, we just had February 2020, a climate change adaptation conference sponsored by Fraser Basin Council. It was called Adaptation Canada. 2020. So their website, it said, the conference brought to Vancouver experts and leaders from diverse sectors, regions, and jurisdictions to work on one of the most urgent issues of our time, how to build climate change resilience in our communities, ecosystems, and economy. So this conference, it was a must all sorry, a must attend for people in all orders of government, federal, provincial, municipal, and indigenous industry, academia, and non-government organizations. So over the course of the last couple of years, I've discovered that this climate change adaptation field, it involves a lot of people who are city planners, engineers, sustainability professionals, policy makers, scientists, etc. It's not that easy if you want to go online and find out, oh, is there an actual master's degree, bachelor or master's degree in climate change adaptation? I think, for example, one university in Australia, they're just starting up a climate change adaptation master's program. At University of Waterloo, there is a, a master's of climate change. I took half of that, we could say in a uh, diploma, a graduate diploma of climate risk management. But these issues are be, are up and coming and hopefully there'll be more education. Now you could go on websites like LinkedIn, Indeed.com and you could find out, yes, there are jobs that fit under the description of climate change adaptation. Emergency management. Now, this is basically a profession where people manage emergencies. If you think that uh, emergencies can actually be managed, manage here, what does it mean? It's doing our best to mitigate, prepare for, respond to, and recover from emergencies. So that could be earthquakes, storms, floods, wildfires. It could be pandemics like SARS, Ebola, or what we're in right now, COVID-19. Now, for example, where I live in British Columbia, Canada, we actually have a provincial government department that's called the Health Emergency Management. So it's branched out into that area, that specialization. Now, emergencies can also include attacks by foreign states, hackers, terrorists, etc. So this is why security is closely related to emergency management. I studied in, as I told you before, Justice Institute of British Columbia and the emergency management department there, they actually call it emergency and security man management. That's one of the diplomas that I got. In Canada, actually, the federal government calls their department that deals with all emergency management issues. They call it Public Safety Canada. In some interior areas away from Vancouver, here in British Columbia, they label their emergency management as protective services. If you look in business, they call this field business continuity. That is ensuring that businesses can continue despite disasters. Emergency management, it is a very broad field and it is ever diversifying. So for myself, one of my career goals is to assist in bring the fields of emergency and security management and climate change adaptation closer together to see that a lot of 
cross-pollinization continues and increases. Now, some emergency managers out there, they're not always aware of climate change and some of the other environmental issues, how this exactly exacerbates disasters and also community security. But on the other hand, one of uh, my professors emailed me when I asked him this question. He said that actually climate change adaptation professionals, they could learn a lot of techniques from emergency managers. So there's a lot of cross-pollinization, a lot of collaboration that I do believe will take place. And I want to be part of it. Now, who's the messenger here? I'll tell you a little bit about myself. More than a half century ago, there was a Canadian professor named Marshall McLuhan at the University of Toronto. I took a course in my fourth year of my bachelor's program. Marshall McLuhan, he made a statement. Many people thought he was brilliant. Others thought he was a huckster. He said, every technology is an extension of our bodies. The car is an extension of our feet. Microphones and speakers are an extension of our voices. Computers, they're extensions of our brains. Clothing is an extension of our skin. In essence, this podcast is an extension of who I am and where I want to head in my life, in my career. So it's not a hobbyist podcast. I have a background as an educator mostly and also as a career development practitioner practitioner, I did a short stint in real estate. However, a couple years ago, I decided to stop watching climate change, environmental destruction, poisonous political and economic trends, increasing interference from hostile foreign states against democracies from the sidelines. Although I already had a bachelor with a double major in media studies in French, a master's related to cross-cultural studies, teaching English and real estate diplomas, I went back to school and completed several diplomas and certificates. I did about three or four years of schooling in just five semesters, which was basically a year and eight months. So at the present moment, I continue teaching at a local college, as well as volunteering in local and provincial emergency preparedness program. My plan is to work in these fields for the next few decades, to protect communities, to see where climate change and all the other threats are headed, and to prepare as much as possible. To respond to disasters, to assist in recovery, to research, to educate, to save lives, to protect livelihoods, and to help us all survive and even thrive despite all the hardships coming our way. So how will this podcast run? I envision this as having, you know, once in a while, me do a solo run where I'm talking about some important articles or recent news on these in these fields. And also, I've been lining up some guests. So hopefully, we'll have some interviews coming down the pike soon. These will be people who are involved in emergency management, security, climate change, adaptation, and other related topics. So why podcasting? Well, Let me tell you some of the circumstances. As I told you, when I go running, I like to listen to podcasts about disasters, climate change, political and economic trends. And I said to myself, hey, why not me? A podcast may scratch the creative and educational itch that I'm feeling. So people who are out there running, commuting, they're at home cooking or running on a treadmill, whatever they may be doing, they can listen to a podcast Learn new things, get inspired, think outside the box. COVID-19, yes, that dreaded word. We're smack in the middle of a global pandemic. You never thought it would happen, did you? Now, in 2003, I lived in a major Asian city where SARS came. And I was working in the city as an English instructor. It was, it was surreal. We had like, what, 15, 20 million people. They just disappeared from the streets. At first, there was a rush at the airports, the train stations, and then poof, the city became a ghost town. Whenever you'd see people, they were just all wearing masks with these glazed eyes. Now, 
The place I lived was a few blocks from one of the main SARS treatment hospitals in town, and I remember seeing the ambulances rushing up and down the streets. The paramedics inside the ambulances, they were decked out like astronauts. It was like a, one of those pandemic horror slash thriller movies. And, uh, we heard stories about people getting the disease and, and, and getting really sick and dying. We saw online that the disease had spread to other places like Vietnam and it's even spread to uh, Toronto, Canada, where many medical staff in one Toronto hospital died from SARS. Fast forward to early 2020. Now we're even in a worse pandemic. They call it SARS-2. So this time the symptoms, they don't show up soon, but two weeks later. So in those two weeks, people who are infected, they could just be like spreading it around like peanut butter on bread. So please forgive me in advance. This is quite an emotional topic. Allow me right now to just wax a little bit melodramatic. Lockdowns, border closures, jobs lost, airports quiet, streets empty, people banging on pots and pans at 7 p.m. on their balconies, celebrating our brave healthcare workers, even top leaders getting the disease. Thousands of innocents dying, especially the vulnerable with pre-existing health issues. And I would add Aboriginal people and minorities. Hospitals overwhelmed. Nurses and doctors burning out, some even committing suicide. Grocery store workers still doing their jobs. Garbage collectors, bus drivers, police, soldiers, government leaders, cleaners, landscapers truck drivers, people at home, working via Zoom, Microsoft Teams, BlueJeans, or another video conferencing software, Netflix and other streaming services adding thousands of customers, boredom, exhaustion, worry, isolation, loneliness, some overstuffed, others hungry, cooking, cleaning, playing cards, doing concerts on their balconies, watching TV series, texting and calling old friends they hadn't talked to in years, getting close to family or arguing, fighting, getting fatter or losing weight, working out or putting dents on sofa cushions from lying around too much like couch potatoes, grandparents dying, Long-term care homes becoming incubation centers for the spread of the disease. Also prisons, also meat packing plants. Bodies being taken out day by day. Online funerals, weeping children and grandchildren. Some workers in these uh, beef poultry and other meat producers dying and many, many becoming infected. Economies disrupted. Bankruptcies. Stock market plunges. Huge uncertainty about the future. Protests by people who've genuinely run out of money because they're not working for so long. Or others who protest just because they want to get that haircut. Some politicians following science, looking to medical experts, taking care of their populations. Others grandstanding or yawning over the crisis. Many of us just shaking our heads at all of it. COVID-19 has been one of the biggest global challenges in recent human history. And here we are. So producing this podcast for me in the midst of this international crisis. Yeah, it does seem kind of weird. But at the same time, it seems so appropriate. Because they say, whoever they are, necessity is the mother of invention. Every cloud has a silver lining. Make hay while the sun shines. Strike while the iron's hot. When the going gets tough, the tough gets going. It's not the size of the dog in the fight, but the size of the fight in the dog. From the worst of crises, 
comes, the best of our characteristics. Leaders are born out of the fire. So how's that for being melodramatic? Now, it just seems to me, in the midst of this chaotic situation, this is the perfect time to start a podcast like this. So we'll see where it goes. I may die of COVID-19 next month, or I may live to be over 100. No one but me may listen to this podcast, or I may get thousands of listeners worldwide. Who knows? The journey of a thousand miles or kilometers begins with one small step. Thanks for listening, everyone. Stay safe out there and stay tuned for more. This is Vin Nelson.